Okay, so this morning, um, I'd like to bring a word of the Lord to you. Um, the title of the message is Natural versus Supernatural or Natural Supernatural. And um, I had four messages prepared, or I was looking at four messages and struggling to find which message. I mean, I, I, I did think this, I, I need your prayers as a church, because I have great difficulty in bringing the word. Um, the, the difficulty I have is, is knowing what you need. And um, the Apostle Paul prays twice, uh, sorry, he, he, he writes twice in, in his uh, letters, he, he writes to the Philippians, uh, um, uh, uh, in uh, chapter 1 verse 19 and also to the Ephesians in chapter 6 verse 19 and asks them for prayer mm. um, so that he may be able to do what he's meant to do mm. and um, uh, one of the, the requests is that he may be released uh, from his, uh, his prison and the other one is that he may preach mm. uh, the, the correct mm. and so um, as a corporate body I'd, I would appreciate your prayers because I do have a struggle every time. Uh, so I had these four messages that I was battling over. Uh, and in, in the end it turned out to be none of them. <laughs> it was none of them in the end. Because the Lord gave me this on, on Friday. Or Thursday evening, Friday. Uh, and he so gripped me that I just, I, I, I couldn't uh, look at those others again. So, what we have to do is um, we have to look at an episode in the ministry of Jesus um, that occurred right towards the very end of his ministry. <clears throat> he is just about to prepare for the Passover uh, meal uh, and then go to uh, be crucified. But th these, these events occurred just before this. And... Um, There's something in here that is that is very illustrative of the natural and the supernatural, okay, and how we deal with that and how we relate to that. And um, so, what I want to do is read to you the episode from start to finish of this event. All right. Now, what I want you to try and do, you can read along with it. Or you can close your eyes. But what I really want you to do is try and put yourself in there. Or try and imagine how it is and what's happening. And, and, and try and see the characters. And, and try and see the whole thing. Because this is real, real events that are recorded for us here. Okay. <clears throat> so we're in the Gospel of John. And... Um, we, it's quite a lengthy reading because this is quite a, a long, um, well, it's quite an in-depth event. Uh, so there's a lot of detail in it. So we're in the Gospel of John and we start at chapter 10. And we go right through <coughs> to um, chapter 11. Uh, Verse 54, so it's quite a lengthy reading that I want to do, so, so I'll just press on and do that, but try and, try and imagine what's happening, okay, as it's like a little movie or something like that is, um, in your mind, okay. <clears throat> so, John chapter 10, verse 22, at that time the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem, it was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. 
I give them eternal life. They will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, You are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, as scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him, whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, <coughs> that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and that I, I am in the Father. Again they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. Mm. He went away across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptising at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man has, was true. And many believed him there. Now a certain man was ill. Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary <coughs> who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve, twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying his things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Mm. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go also, that we may die with him. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary <coughs> to console their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother, brother would not have died. 
But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will lie and rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, in, saying in private, The teacher is here, and he is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, <coughs> supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mm. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Then he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, a stone, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odour, for he has been dead four days. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, 
they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness, to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples. Mm -hmm. So we have in <coughs> this whole episode <coughs> excuse me, a very good example of the natural and the supernatural. And the most crucial and operative um, verses here are in chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. Now, just on a superficial reading of them, they seem completely logical, don't they? <clears throat> Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If, anybody, uh, if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, that, just on the surface of that, that seems completely normal and natural. There's daylight, you don't stumble. At night, if you don't have light, you stumble. But there's a deeper meaning in this. There's a supernatural, there's a natural and there's a supernatural in this, okay? There are two kingdoms being described in these two verses. Two kingdoms here that Jesus is, is talking about. Look at the words. Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. This world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles. Because the light is not in him. Okay? Now, all of the events that follow on from that, the statements of people, their actions come from that, come from the, the contrast between those two. Now, I've made this little uh, diagram here. We have the worldly kingdom, the light of this world, populated by the unsaved. We'll, we'll look at that in a second. The unsaved walk with the natural. With the natural, you have limitation. And the limitation brings about the, the people, the person's vision, their actions in their life. Their understanding, their actions, everything about the person's life comes from the natural. And the natural is limited. Thus it says... Are there not 12 hours in the day? 12 hours of light. After the 12 hours of light, what are there? As described in these two verses. There are darkness. Mm -hmm. And in the darkness, there is stumbling. That is a limitation. You need the light of this world. It does not, he walks. In the day, he does not stumble, it says in verse 9, because he sees the light of this world. So you have a natural limitation, the light of this world. That is a natural limitation. From that natural limitation, the person's vision, their actions, their whole life comes from that. This is the unsaved in this worldly kingdom. Now... We have this other kingdom contrasted here. This is the heavenly kingdom. Mm. Now the heavenly kingdom is populated by the saved. Because it's a heavenly kingdom, it's not natural. It is supernatural. Okay. From the supernatural comes the vision, the action and the life of the person. Mm. 
and also the corporate entity, the church. If a church is operating in a natural way, if a church is operating in a natural way, it will have natural limitations. Okay? It will be involved in all kinds of nice things, um, but thank you very much. It will be involved in all kinds of nice activities, um, but if it's a, if it's naturalistic, if it's humanistic, then it will have limitations, and that will inform the life of the church. Okay, but if a church is working in the supernatural realm then that aspect does not appear. Okay. Now, you'll notice that I've put a link here between here and here. Right? People in the heavenly kingdom, the saved, can and often do operate here in this worldly kingdom. It's in brackets because you don't belong there. The person doesn't actually belong there. But their life, actions, their vision, actions and life, everything they do can actually flow in this direction. They can, although they're saved, they can have natural, have a natural approach to everything. And therefore, limitation. Um, and they will have a very limited life. Now, let's look at some examples in this here. Jesus has just been uh, threatened with stoning uh, in, the, uh, in the temple in Jerusalem uh, at the Feast of Dedication. And uh, he, uh, he escapes that. They don't actually stone him to death, so he, he, he gets away from there. But he withdraws, doesn't he? And um, uh, he went across the Jordan. And um, but many across there still believe in him. It says at the end of uh, chapter ten. But then. This great friend of his, Lazarus, he, he's ill, and uh, he actually dies. And um, so when he hears about it, uh, he, just, he knows that something has to be done it, about it. And he knows that it's nothing to do with death, that this is something to do with the kingdom. This is some supernatural thing. He's not looking at this in a natural way. So what does he say <clears throat> in verse 7 of chapter 11? Let us go to Judea again. And straight away they put up this objection. Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going over there again? Natural thinking. Natural thinking. Okay? Okay. Jesus has just said, let's go over there again. <laughs> How can you object to somebody like Jesus saying, let's go over there again? Do you not understand who he is? In other words, if he says something, there is a reason for it and a meaning to it. Okay? Because Jesus is here supernatural right his vision actions life everything about him is informed from the heavenly kingdom so he says this but they put up an objection straight away lord there's danger they're going to kill you over there you guess it's, it's illogical you can't do that so jesus then gives them this example of the two kingdoms natural kingdom and the heavenly kingdom okay and then he tells them about this thing about Lazarus has fallen asleep. And, and, and again, they just put up this straight, ah, ah, yes, if he's fallen asleep, then he'll recover. 
natural thinking. Mm -hmm. And he has to get blunt with them and say, he's dead. Mm -hmm. This guy has actually died. And I'm glad that he died. Mm. Even though he's his friend. Mm. I'm glad he died. Why? For a reason. So that you may believe. Because that's more important. Mm. And then you see right at the end there um, of that little episode about Jesus said in verse 16, it says, So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, it's almost like, you know, Jesus is walking, oh, come on, we'll go and die with him. Let's go, oh, come on, let, we'll go, he's going to die. He's going to die. Lazarus is dead, Jesus is going to die, well, let's all just go and die with him. <laughs> this is just natural thinking, okay? They're going to danger. Even though Jesus has said, we're going to go and do something here. They're just thinking, this is a dangerous thing, we're all going to die. There's great risk here. Okay? That's natural thinking. So that's informing their life. That's informing their choices. That's informing their vision. Now, here we have, we go further on here. Um, verse 17, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Now this man is decomposing. Um, is in a state of decomposition. He's been buried for four days. And um, now verse 20 says, uh, When Martha um, heard Jesus was coming, she went and met him, uh, and Mary remained seated in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, now we encounter Mar Martha first off in, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 38. Now Martha is a woman of action, Right? When she hears of Jesus in, in Luke's Gospel, she invites him in. But uh, <laughs> there's one stage in the proceedings where Martha goes up to Jesus and confronts him. And tells him, tell her, her sis tell my sister to help me. Because her, her sister is, is sitting at Jesus' feet listening yeah. to his teaching. And Martha's caught up with all this preparations and doing all this... Jewish hospitality, which they're meant to do, uh, but uh, but she's she's a she's a powerful woman, right? Nothing wrong with that. She's bold and powerful, a woman of action. So she's got up and she's told Jesus, "Tell my sister to help me." And Jesus kindly said, "Well, remonstrates. Well, no, she's chosen the better thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, if, what you're doing is okay, but she's doing the better thing, and that's being at my feet. Listen to this." The food and preparations, they can wait. Mm -hmm. We don't need that. The better thing is here at my feet. Amen. So, she's, so, so he's, she's correcting her. But you see here again, she gets up and she goes to Jesus and she is face to face with him, with the Messiah, face to face with him. And um, she says in verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So she's a woman of action, right? She's blunt, she speaks straight out there she says but um even now i know that whatever you ask from god god will give you so she knows jesus she knows this is you know this is far on in jesus's ministry there's a lot of history known about jesus his abilities his, what he does what he doesn't do they, they, they've seen it okay so jesus said to her your brother will rise again. Now, verse 24. Here we go. Natural. Right? Natural. Verse 24. Martha said, I know that he will raise, he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Mm -hmm. Now that is just doctrinal teaching that she's understood from the Messiah, from Jesus. I know that he will rise on the last day because he's a believer, just like I am. You know, that, that is the doctrine. There's a resurrection. There's going to be a resurrection. I know that. Okay. But that's just a natural kind of thinking. As Jesus says to her, in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he, he shall live. And whoever, uh, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Mm -hmm. Do you believe this? And she confesses, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, 
the Son of God who's coming into the world. But at that point, she doesn't believe that anything can happen now. This is all about the resurrection. She understands and has accepted the doctrine of the resurrection. Jesus has preached about the resurrection. He says, look, I'm the resurrection. Do you believe this? And she says, yes. She believes that. But she still thinks this way. She's not here. She, she knows this. This is a natural, accepted thing. She has accepted that as a doctrine. Yes, this brother of hers will rise from the dead. That's, that's what she's accepted. Then it goes on. Jesus then, then, when she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary in private, saying, the teacher, the teacher is here calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly. And uh, Jesus was still out there. So this is, the, you know, he's not gone anywhere near this village yet. He's still out there. And so she goes out. Now look, look at the contrast between the two uh, women here. There's a nice subtle little thing here. <clears throat> when Martha gets up and goes out, what happens to all the mourners? They're still there with Mary, aren't they? They're still with Mary. But when Mary gets up, what happens? They all get up and they go with her. There's just a tiny, subtle little thing there, a little tiny little nugget. Mary is a different kind of temperament. And obviously, I'm not saying that Martha hasn't been weeping, but they, they look at her and they, um, they look at her and say, oh, she's going out there to the tomb to weep. So they go out there to weep with her. But they, they didn't go with Martha. Martha suddenly got up. Mary, Mary suddenly got up. And both of the women suddenly got up. But they didn't go with Martha. They went with Mary. So there must be something about Mary. Uh, uh, this, this thing about Mary in the feet of Jesus. She, she, she is a woman at the feet of the feet. We need to be people of the feet. Amen. Mary anointed his feet, washed with the hair, you know, dried with the hair. She was, a, she sat at the feet of Jesus. We need to be people of the feet if we want the others to go with us, rather than the, I don't know. There's something in there. I don't know what it. I don't quite know what it is, but there's something about Mary in there. But anyway, so she gets up and she goes and says almost the very same words to to Jesus. Um, in verse 32, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Right? But that's all she said. She didn't go on any anywhere else. She, she never said anything else. She just said that. And then it goes on here. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And the Jews said, See how he loved him. Some of them said, this guy, he opened this blind man's eyes, but couldn't he keep, his, this guy, this friend of his, he couldn't keep him from dying. Then verse 38 says, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the, the tomb. Verse 33, it says, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Mm. We have a prayer meeting here on a Tuesday. And um, 
Prayer meetings generally in churches are not very well attended. And um, unless there's some very pressing reason, like a person's at work or there's some kind of family crisis, I think reading this, there are, could be a combination of two things here. Well, either one or the other or both. Now, I don't want to say this to make people guilty because there is no guilt associated with this at all. Mm. Please don't feel guilty. But what I am saying here is I want you to realise that you are not walking by the light of this world. You have the light in you. Mm -hmm. Right? Verses 9 and 10. The operative on the foundational verses of this whole episode, the illustrative verses, what Jesus is illustrating to them at the very start, inform us of these two kingdoms, the light of this world and the light in him. Mm. The light in him. Mm. Not, the, not anything else. Now you have the light in you. Mm. You are in this mm. kingdom. Mm. You have supernatural light. You are not in any way in any limitation. Mm. Okay? So therefore, the question that comes to my mind about prayer meetings, not just our prayer meeting, but prayer meetings in churches, how they are so <coughs> poorly attended, is, the question that comes to my mind is this, do the people not have the same experience as Jesus Christ? that they are not deeply moved and troubled in spirit about the things of this darkness, this world, that they want to come and do something about it. Or is it a combination of that and the fact that they don't know this, that they have the light inside them that they can actually do something about it. Because Jesus goes on to demonstrate that his compassion, his being deeply moved in spirit and troubled, had an outcome which was based on the kingdom of God. His life is driven by this. Is it that the people don't have the compassion then they're not deeply moved inside in the first place. Or is it because they don't understand who they are? Or is it because there's a combination of both? Or is it because they are here, operating in a natural kind of idea that they, they don't come to prayer meetings because they don't think like Martha? Martha said, I know that whatever you ask of God, he will give you. Amen. Is that why people think they don't come to, to prayer meetings? Because they don't think that they have this light, that what they say and what they proclaim and what they petition God for will not work. The outcome, the vision of their life, is therefore limited. Therefore the church, the church prayer meetings are not populated well. Please don't get me wrong. Do not feel guilty. If you cannot come to a prayer meeting for very, very legitimate reasons like being at work or having some other kind of thing, then that's fine and completely acceptable. Mm -hmm. But don't tell me... Don't give me any excuse that's not important. Mm. 
It's not acceptable. You, you tell Jesus why you can't come. You tell Jesus why you're, you're not troubled and, and deeply moved in your heart about things that are going on in this world. He has given us a command to pray. Look at Timothy. The letter of Timothy. First of all, supplications. Prayers, intercessions be made for all men. Why? Well, because God wants to do work on earth. God is concerned. God is deeply troubled. Jesus was deeply troubled and moved in his heart. We must understand that we do not walk by the light of this world. Amen. We must understand that we are from the heavenly kingdom. Mm. We must understand this. Otherwise we will be in that position. Mm. And our thinking, our understanding, our vision, our everything that informs our life will have limitation. Mm. We will be limited in what we do. And everything in our life will have lack limitation we will not be living this kind of supernatural life we will not raise the dead we will not change the political atmosphere we will not bring about the things of god on the earth we will not do it if we are in that position because we will be thinking naturally See, even what happens here, uh, what happens next is, he, he goes over and says, take away the stone. Mm. Take, move, get rid of this stone, move the stone. Okay? And what happens is, is, um, is here's Martha um, in verse 39. Martha, here, here's Martha, natural again, Martha. She says here, oh, Lord, there'll be an odour. Jesus doesn't say anything lightly. Mm. Anything lightly. It's a command. Take away the stone. He knows full well there will be an odour. This man is rotting. There will be an odour. Anyone who works in healthcare or, or various other fields know what the smell of death is like. Okay? Jesus knows this. But God's purpose must prevail. Will the odour of death, will death itself mm. prevail over something that God has determined to do? Mm. No. Cannot. It cannot. So then Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said this prayer. And what does he say? I thank you that you have heard me. So he's already prayed about this. Because it's past tense. Amen. He's not praying that it would happen now. He's already prayed about this. He already knows about this. He already knows about the whole thing about Lazarus falling and dying. The, he, he tells the, the disciples, oh, he's fallen asleep. And they naturally think, oh, well, he'll recover, he'll get better then, he's resting. He has to tell them, he's dead. He's already prayed. Father, I, 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 he's, he's praying this for their benefit, for their ears to hear. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around me, that they may believe that you sent me. In other words, that they'll put their trust in me. Okay? He's already dealt with this. So then when he says this, he says here, <laughs> if you come to our prayer meeting on a Tuesday, you you will come to. I, I don't know what kind of prayer meetings you've been to in your life. All right. Now Jane and I have been through uh, you know some some different churches, and we have been to some of the deadest and driest and most awful prayer meetings that you could ever go to. Boring, dry. 
tedious. Oh dear. This. Oh. And you just think, how on earth could this prayers get through? There is just nothing here. You come on Tuesday here. Oh boy. <laughs> Jesus said in a loud voice, yes. I'll tell you what, there's a volume control here, <laughs> and it is whacked up high <laughs> on a prayer meeting here. Yes. Amen. We pray. I mean, I, I, my, I am hope, I'm hoping for the day. Well, I mean, this is a, usually a, a meeting room. There's a tables in the middle here. We take them out for the service. And, and what happens is on a Tuesday, we, the tables are in here because there's not many of us. So we kind of wander around the outside and there is a joyous mm. riot mm. of Amen. prayer Amen. and declaration Amen. and proclamation mm. and intercession. Mm. And I, I am praying for the day that I hope these tables are out. Amen. Because there's so many people milling around in here, mm. spitting over each other Come in on. prayer Amen. and Amen. declaration. Because they know who they are. Mm. And they know that what they're saying, because they have a light inside them. Amen. They know that Amen. what they're saying yes. works. Amen. Because Amen. Jesus said, Lazarus, Amen. come out! Amen. He had to use his name mm. because if he said come out, all the graves would have opened. <laughs> <laughs> he had to be specific. Amen. <laughs> now we come here and we are very specific yes. in our loud prayers. Yes. Come to prayer. Mm. Amen. Unless you're prevented by some serious thing, come to prayer. Amen. If you've never been to, to, to prayer like this, Come to pray. Mm. You're in for an experience. Mm. <laughs> if you don't know how to pray, mm. come to pray. You will, learn. <laughs> yeah. you will not learn this. Yeah. Yeah. Right? If you know this, you will soon unlearn this. The difference between that kingdom, mm. the light of this world, mm. yeah. and this kingdom, mm. that Amen. is supernatural. Mm. Mm. Hallelujah. Mm. So what happens? He's risen from the dead. Hallelujah. They unbind him. Mm. Okay. The people there who minister to him, without doubt, know that this man was dead because they smell him. Mm. Mm. They take all these rotting, mm. filthy things off him. But he is renewed. Amen. He is not... <coughs> I won't go into the details of what happens to a corpse. Mm. But he is not like that. Mm. They take him off and he is renewed. Mm. And he is now a spectacle. Mm. People see this. Mm. In verse 45, many of the Jews who had come with Martha, no, not Martha, with Mary, many of the Jews who had come with Mary and seen what he did, mm. believed in him. Amen. But some of the Jews went away. I mean, <laughs> why? Because what does, he, what does Jesus say? So, some of the Jews, sorry, some of the Jews... Verse 46, some of the Jews went away, went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had did. These are some of the Jews. Alright? Look at, look at chapter 10. Okay. Verse 26. But you do not believe me because you are not part of my flock. Mm. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Amen. Right? So those people, they, yeah, they were natural people. They weren't supernatural people, saved. They had gone and seen this miracle, this spectacle. But, <laughs> because they were natural, unsaved people, they went and reported this thing. 
They didn't believe in Jesus. Because they were not part of his flock. They just went to these authorities. And then the authorities, they got the wind up about this. We're going to lose all our thing here. Our, our, our power, our prestige, our nation, everything. The Romans are just going to take it away. We're going to lose our show. We're going to lose everything here. Because all, all the people are going to... What can we do is raising the dead. And it's, it can't be hidden. We're going to have to do something about him. So they make plans to put him to death. Mm. Now that is this. The unsaved natural people. And their vision, action and life comes from that. What can they do? Everybody likes certainty, don't they? Mm. They want certainty. Mm. They want the control. They don't want God. God is uncertain, right? What they want is the light of this world. Ah, there, Jesus said it. Jesus said it, right? Jesus said about the certainty of this world. Aren't there 12 hours in the day? Right? That's certainty. Absolute certainty. 12 hours in the day. And you walk in that, you won't stumble. But if you walk around at night, you'll stumble because you don't have the light in you. But we walk around in the dark. Because we have the light. Right? Look at Psalm um, <coughs> 77 verse 19. 